The Square Ball Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors. LeviSolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball for a 10% discount on your legal fees. But it gets more exciting than that, doesn't it, Michael Normanson? 15% I'm hearing. Yeah. This, oh. is, this, this, is, this is brand new information to me, but yeah. <laughs> on what, I mean, get, name I some services that that might be. There's probate, yep. there's wills, and yep. there's also conveyancing. Would you say them in that order or would you say a different order? Conveyancing, wills, probate, you can do them. Keep... Any, wills, probate, conveyancing. That's, that's the one everybody knows and loves, isn't mm-hmm. it? Which is your favourite? Uh, hello, Phil, hi. Uh, oh, I would say probably conveyancing today. Um because from first time buyers, people moving into bigger houses for family uh, families that are growing, downsizers, and professional landlords, I've heard that Levi Solicitors can help. And I didn't read that off a sheet in no, front of me. No, like Elton John, not reading that in front of you. <laughs> no. no. German managers moving to the area looking to buy. Very good topical. Point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. American managers looking to leave. Mm-hmm. They, they need unique events when you sell a house. You could just it? move one into the other, couldn't yeah. you? Let him. Um, yeah, it's 15% off if you go to uh, Monday Club, if you quote Monday Club when you contact Levi Solicitors, levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash Monday Club to take advantage of the 15% discount. We should really have a think about that URL because it's not the Monday show today, is it? But that's where the discount lies. It's probably your fault, this I love, stuff. I love the idea of phoning up lawyers and going, Monday Club, and you get money, <laughs> you get money off. Brilliant. Um, no, it's not the, not the Monday Club. Um, it's the Friday Club with equally as little to say as we would have had on the, on the Monday Club as well. It's been a quite a quiet week, has it not? Do we need to get used to this? Is this what the 49ers are going to be like? They're just going to stay silent forever. What if we don't What if we don't appoint a manager? What if we don't ever get ratified by the EFL? Then what do we do? What if the takeover never goes through, what do, do Leach United just disappear and in 10 years' time everybody says, do you remember that club? What would, and Ellen Road becomes, actually does become a hotel. Yeah. Maybe it's the way to keep the squad together. What? Put me in a hotel? No, no, no one... No one do anything. No one answer the phone. <laughs> no one allowed to leave. Fully Hugh Jenkins Here's it. Here forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been strange, hasn't it? So we still don't, at the time of recording, which is 10.30 now, Friday morning, we don't have confirmation on a manager. You mentioned a German manager there. Who did you have in mind, Michael? Daniel, obviously. Uh, what, what would he say about the opportunity, do you think? <laughs> I'm waiting by the phone still. <laughs> <laughs> now, I assume they've spoken to him. They have spoken to him. You've, you've confirmed that, yeah, I think, haven't you, have spoken to him. So why haven't we appointed him? I've I've been on holiday this week, which is probably worth saying, and I haven't. This sounds like a, this sounds like a start or, of a start of a cop out for you. Yeah, for or, me. or pulled a pulled a leg particularly. Um, but it did come in on the on the proviso that we all understood that there was nothing to massively get our teeth into uh, at the moment. Although I'm very conscious of the fact that we could walk out of here and find that the takeover um, gets ratified, or we we get a head coach because it is all kind of pending and waiting and and just awaiting white smoke. Green light, um, whatever you whatever you want to say. The, the trouble with the takeover is that there doesn't seem to be any inherent problem with it or any inherent issue with the people involved or anything like that or of the 49ers themselves. But it is dependent on the paperwork getting finished so and completed and ratified. So there is that aspect of how long is a piece of string it will go through when the EFL says yay. And, you know, it. Th- there's the inclination to say this is taking forever, they need to get on with it, this, that and the other. It's, it's not their fault that it was, you know, nine, ten days into June at the point where Radrazani and the 49ers actually agreed this takeover deal. It's not their fault that there was no relegation provision in place for the very end of the season or prior to the end of the season. Um, and it kind of takes as long as it takes. So I don't think it will be miles away, but we've been saying that for a while now. Haven't we? I mean, it's been a while since we've had a Leeds United owner demonising the AFL. We should try it again. Yeah. Yeah, back back in the year, Phil, and it's like we've never been away. Yeah, the, the, the fight starts instantly. Um, but it, it it's one of those things, isn't it, that everybody agrees that owners should be um, checked and owners should have to go through tests. And I think everybody agrees that the owners and directors test makes sense um, because it does, in theory anyway, keep people out of the game who you wouldn't want in the game. Um, I have to say, when you start to pick through some of the people who are in the game, it's not exactly foolproof. But then when it's your club that's caught in this... Um, hold up, if you want to call it that, or caught, caught in this impasse of waiting for the EFL to, to formally approve. You want to see some action and you want to see some pretty urgent action. Um, but I think to say it's a, there's been a hold up would be presumptuous um, because I don't think the EFL are taking any longer than they normally would with this sort of thing. It just has been the case that it's, you know, they've been quite late to the table with this one, Radrazani and the 49ers. If only they were in some sort of Middle Eastern petrodollar state and just they could just write a letter then saying well, now we're not to do with this it's them like someone else 
Mm, yeah, um, <laughs> there, is, there is another slight problem here as well. In that, um, had had the takeover, and I think I've touched on this previously, had the takeover gone through with Leeds in the Premier League, it was set up. It was it was arranged. Our understanding was that the paperwork with the, the Premier League, um, their owners and directors test had been processed, had been done. It was all good to go, and we were expecting it to become formally official on July the first. But the EFL's test while it is aligned with the Premier Leagues it's not identical so it's not just a case of shunt the paperwork from one to the other it's not a case of the Premier League saying oh yeah we're fine with this so you can be fine with this you have to go through um, slightly different checks and it has to be processed again so it takes time it, in the piece we've been writing about the takeover we've made the point that there's kind of 10 or 11 core people at the centre of this group who will all need to go through the test but there is also this wider group of you know added values they call it but the, the people who've invested less uh, smaller amounts in the 49ers um, uh, investment vehicle and it might be that the EFL are having to look through that as well to decide if any of them um, need to be processed through the, the owners and directors test as well so it, it can be quite complex and as I say I think everybody will feel like this is taking forever because of the ticking clock moving towards pre-season and the start of the season itself. Um, but actually, I think it was June the 9th when we had the agreement in principle announced by the 49ers and Rad Rosani. So they're, you know, they're kind of new to the table with this. So it's only three weeks or whatever. Um, can I throw this one at you? And tell Depends me if I'm, what it is. Well, I'm going to throw it at you. So this is where we, we may expose our lack of knowledge. Yes, probably. Hideously, yes. Or sound very, very clever. But as I understood it, because I had a a thumb through the owners and directors test, because you know what? I've got nothing better to do at this time of year um, on the EFL website. And while it was, I think it was last year's information, because they have just updated it and got it in line with the the Premier League, haven't they, at their AGM, which was on the 8th of June. Yes. So the day before. Um, It says in there about relevant person, and they're testing for relevant people. So like, even if you are not a shareholder and you're a director, you're deemed a relevant person. But essentially, you become a relevant person as a shareholder if you own 25% or more. It was 30, it's now been dropped to 25, which is in line with the Premier League. So these added value people, none of them are going to be owning 25% of the club, are no. they? But because the vehicle itself is owning more than 25% of the club, they're deemed to be relevant in that sense. So if they own shares directly in Leeds, they wouldn't be relevant, but because they own shares in the vehicle, they are relevant. Make it make sense. Well, I was told that not everybody who was in the entire group was going to have to go through the owners and directors test. Certainly the people in the core group, i.e. your your main investors, the people who are putting in the most money, the people with the most influence over 49ers Enterprises strategy and and what they'll do um, at Leeds. Although I'll say it again, this is not going to be run by committee. You know, it will be Paragmarati as chairman who will be overseeing this and he will be fronting um, the 49ers project at Leeds. Tim and Colin Meader, isn't it? Colin Meader will be joining the board as well. Yeah, Colin Meader is, um, I think, vice president at 49ers Enterprises, so below, uh, just directly below Marathi in that um, that group as well. Um, so they would they would have to go through the test, um, but it might be, and, and I'm speculating here because the EFL never comment on any of this and never discuss it um, with you directly, but it might be that they need to look through the list of other people who are involved to establish and make sure and, and to be confident that none of those people who are, who they're being told um, are not classed as relevant people actually aren't classed as relevant people. And I don't doubt at all that the information they're being given will be above board and, and most likely accurate. But they have to check these things. That's the whole point of the test. But as I was just saying before, in some cases with the Premier League, that all you need to do is provide written assurances that you're nothing to do with something. And that's normally enough, isn't it? Um, and I yes, I am being a little you, bit tongue in cheek. Uh, yeah, uh, you you can remember how long the Saudi takeover of Newcastle um, got tied up and and delayed, although there was a strong feeling that that was somewhat related to a, a kind of separate battle between Qatar and the Saudis over TV rights. But that's way too complicated to get in, but into. But that sort of stuff can can influence it. Um, and it it is you know there are quite a lot of legalities involved. It certainly makes a difference depending on how many parties and groups um, feature in a takeover. So if you have one, essentially one unit who are buying Leeds United out, for example, you probably have fewer people to to go through. But when you're a group like 49ers Enterprises, which is a collection of different individuals, different parties, um, it probably does bump up the amount of paperwork that needs to be done. And that's not to say that the EFL would look at it and say it's an excessive amount of paperwork or it therefore needs to take a long period of time. But I think what they might say is that they've only been on this for three weeks so far. And, it, you know, it takes longer than that. 
And what they do do under their own regulations, and I mentioned this on our show, is they um, are obligated to provide, within five days of the club submitting, they have to give the club um, a time frame. So I would wonder if we'd had a steer from the club on that or whether maybe the club thought it'd be done by now or do they know? Or they I, I, heard, I heard some flip-flops feet went up on a desk and they said, we'll get around to it when we get around to it. Yeah, summer in it. Summer in it. There's a lot of people away. Uh, the, the club certainly hoped it would be done by now. And as we speak this morning, we still don't have a head coach in place. So, you know, definitely wanted that resolved by this point. Um, I, I think they can... They can give a time frame, but needless to say, if things come through, say some of the documentation that's submitted isn't complete, or if it leads to further checks or, or requires further checks, it can't kind of be a unmovable feast, immovable feast, immovable, unmovable, immovable, immovable. Yeah, poor English, uh, because it has to be ratified in in the right way. So you can't say to somebody, "This will be done by June the thirtieth," only to be sent incomplete paperwork and again I'm not saying that, that 49ers have sent incomplete paperwork but there has to be wriggle room there so that you do actually sign this off in full yeah it's, it's just it's making, utterly tiresome isn't it yeah it's just mm. making, I've just realised I've not, I've not listened to any yeah. of that Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm lying yeah. I was a bit, I was, a bit was like this podcast yeah. generally yeah <laughs> listen I was, I was listening to every single bloody word um, yeah, yeah so, do, do message in if you've turned off already <laughs> yeah. behind the scenes you, you then, would never know what, True. what does this actually mean because there is presumably people still inside Ellen Road doing things and the 49ers are there yeah. running it as if this is going through because they're confident it will. So, Prang Marati is still vice chairman of the club rather than chairman of the club. Andrea Radrazani is still majority shareholder of the club rather than gone completely um, and moving to a position where he holds no shares at all and the 49ers have 100%. It is still as it was on the final day of the season. It is still as it was on June the 8th and then on June the 9th when the deal was agreed, the difference being that this is coming and it is pending and nobody expects um, anybody to roll back on it. But it, it quite clearly, unless they they feel forced into this, they've been waiting for the takeover to go through before appointing a head coach. Um, and it is, in technical terms, it, it still isn't the 49ers' um, authority officially to be able to do that, you know, to appoint a head coach. It is still Radrazani who is chairman of the club, although, you know, he will be having next to no, if any, involvement um, in what the club are doing now, apart from being in, you know, involved in the process of the, the takeover itself. So they've got pre-season coming next week. They have to plan for that irrespective of anything else that's going on. They do still have medical staff. At least they've got Rob Price, who's the head of medical department. They do have still have coaches around the club. Rob Price is going to be in midfield at this, right? He, he probably is, or, or up front. Um, they've got Michael Scubala, obviously, who was caretaker uh, towards the end of last season under 21's coach still in the building so they they do have people who can you know who can pick up a day's work or can can organize the medical testing that you always do when you come back could organize the odd session but there is no way of pretending that this is ideal because it definitely isn't and you know nobody would choose to go into pre-season minus a head coach it's going to be fuck though isn't it we all know it well last last friday before i went away on holiday um somebody who is involved in the process externally external of the club um, but had been uh, had knowledge of the interview process said that their understanding was that Leeds were in the process of trying to nail down a deal with FARC specifically the club denied that at the time and said it was still open they were still considering um, what to do um, still trying to make a final decision after the interviews um, but there has obviously been more in the way reports this week saying that it will be FARC or it looks very likely to be FARC. And as we've kind of said all along, he's been right in the thick of it. You know, he was one of the interviewees. He was somebody who they they found very impressive in the initial Zoom calls, um, the initial um, assessments that they did of potential candidates. Uh, and as we've been saying all along, it would certainly fit, wouldn't it? It would. And by the way, we've had clarification on how you pronounce the surname. So do you oh, want yeah, to hear it? Yeah. So um, let me just trace the, uh, the tweets. It was uh, Matt Thomas, who's at Empty UK, um, tagged us in it and asked Derek Ray, uh, who's Ray Com, who does the the commentary voice on FIFA. That's right. Um, I was just about to be facetious and say, what what are Matt's credentials for answering this? However, <laughs> <laughs> I what I want to hear you do now is is uh, trash Derek Ray. Uh, yeah. off, off you go, Phil. No, no, the mighty Derek Ray will know exactly what he's talking about. So this is from a German, um, a German speaking national, and uh, it's been recorded. You, know, you get these websites where you can record it being said, so you know yes. what it sounds like authentically. And it is here we go, Daniel Farker. Daniel Farker, Farker which right. is what we've been saying, like rhymes with Scott Parker or Peter Parker. Yeah. If you want to deal with it in Spider-Man terms. Yeah. Um, so not Farky, not Fark, Farker. Okay. And for you on the video version, we've just noticed that uh, 
my camera was too low, so it's now the right height again. So if you're wondering why it's changed, that's why. People may be thinking you had something uh, something offensive on your forehead. Just <laughs> deliberately just <laughs> excluded it from the shot. It was just a saggy camera. Um, where were we anyway, Phil? So we've now established the, the pronunciation of Farker. So as you understand it, it's likely to be Farker based on what's been said by the external third party. Um, Farker, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Although I think Carl Robinson has been saying on TalkSport this morning it's a bad idea. For, why is it, why is it a bad idea? I, I wasn't listening. All oh, right, because it's not him. I'm just going on a second-hand report. No, Allardyce <laughs> was um, was sort of trying to tout Robinson for the job, wasn't it, at one point, which I was horrified by, I have to say. Mm. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I have nothing against Carl Robinson. I didn't have long to, to deal with him or, or watch what was going on at Leeds, but I'm not sure how Robinson's record stands out any more than Farker's in the Championship. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it would work, Farker. I'm not saying it was a guaranteed fail-safe option that gets you promoted immediately. But I think you can easily look back at his two Norwich teams that went up as champions and say he does have the measure of this league. Um, he he kind of knows knows what to do in it. I know it's dangerous to sort of get into stuff in more depth when we have had no absolute confirmation. But don't. So let's do it anyway. Uh, what does Farker bring then? It's possession football, isn't it? Um, which is which is one thing. And it seems to be that so the messages that are coming out of the club on the basis of what happened at the end of last season is that Leeds fans want um, possession-based football, attacking football. Does he not deliver all that, all that stuff, particularly in the Championship? I think he probably does. But I think what people will want more than anything else next season is promotion. Isn't it? That is absolutely what people will be after, and and he has he has the track record of of having done it twice. So too does Scott Parker. But I do feel pound for pound that um, Farker's promotions were more impressive, um, and I do I, I do think back to firstly the, the the pressure that he was under at Norwich. You'll remember, do you remember the famous pink dressing room game down there when oh, yeah. Stuart Webber? Yeah, well. Leeds wiped the floor with Norwich and there was a pretty strong suggestion at the time that Farker might be in a bit of trouble. Um, I believe they played Ipswich the following weekend and, and suggestion that, that that might do for him if it went badly wrong. And then everything picked up and, and they started to move like a train. And, and I always find it difficult when I think about his Norwich not to go back to that game at Elland Road when they completely outclassed Leeds, um, which... You know, just didn't happen very often at all. We're going to we're going to do that as a guide, by the way, aren't we? I think Michael. Mm -hmm. um, well, assuming we appoint and, him, if we appoint him, yeah, yeah. If he if he does get appointed, I'm going to go back and watch that and and have a look at what happened. But that was almost like the night that marked out the fact that Norwich were going to win the title, and it was going to come down to a scramble for second place, which in the end was between Leeds and and Sheffield United. But I remember going away from that game and thinking they've probably got the legs on Leeds here. Um, and that's no, given how good Bielsa was and given how good Leeds were under Bielsa, that's no no mean feat. I mean, I don't think with Wilder's Sheffield United and Bielsa's Leeds in it, that was an easy championship to win at all. I, no. I think quite the opposite. Um, so, you know, it, it's not perfect, Farker. It didn't go too well for him in the Premier League, although I, I do think you have to factor in Norwich's budget for that. Uh, but it seems like a it seems like a fairly sensible sensible move I would have said Is he likely to bring his, his coaching team with him as well because it seems like he's at Norwich and Munch and Gladbach he's had the same the core group around him who are presumably all available as well I would imagine so yeah it would, it would make sense although given that we can't even say at this point that it's definitely going to be him it's a little bit difficult <laughs> to get into the into the backroom team as well but yeah no he, he unlike Marsh for example who seemed to he didn't seem to have a kind of fixed um, backroom team behind him um, Farker very much seems to, yeah. And none of them from Soccer Aid. You, you wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> oh, they don't knock Soccer Aid. I watched, I watched it the other week, some quality play. You know that game, that season, that promotion charge that we obviously fell on our asses eventually with Derby? Are you kind of glad that we didn't go up that, that season in a roundabout way because of what followed? Oh, or would yeah. you have rather gone up first season via the playoffs or would you rather have won it second season like we did? Oh, the idea of winning something at Wembley. I don't know. It's gotten a low. As someone who's seen us playing three finals and not even score a goal, nah, the idea of having an actual good day out. Nah, it's better to take the title than it is to win the playoffs. I think. I I think with hindsight, you can see it was a it was a kind of perfect story making the playoffs, not quite making it, and then you know, I don't I don't know what they say destroying the league the following season, but they finished a long way clear the leads, and they were quite evidently the best team in it. And I think the ability to go second time around, particularly after they'd fallen short in the way that they did, it enhanced Bielsa's reputation, I think, and enhanced the, the quality of the job that he did. 
Um, had they gone up that first season, I don't think any of us would have complained. And it would have reflected on him incredibly well, the fact that he was able to pick that up and in one year just go bang. You know, well, It's um, taken us 20 minutes to get on to uh, reminiscing about Bielsa. Yes. I thought that might happen this week. It was Dan's fault. <laughs> but it was lovely, wasn't it? It was just a lovely... And the, the more distance there is between then and now, the more I look back at it in a really misty-eyed fashion. Well, you'd feel offended if Farky gets us up with 100 points. You'd be like, ah, it's not no. as good still. No, because he's, he's a good coach, is Farker. He is, you know, and you have to sort of be philosophical about that. Don't you? This is a dangerous speculation to get into, isn't it? It is, but it's your fault. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, true. I, I take, so, I take no. Let's, no let's, let's lean into it. Whatsoever. Let's just lean into it, Phil. Um, no, not at all. I, I, it'll always be one of the most special times of my life. I think when Bielsa was here, just it was just he's unique, isn't he? He's just he's a complete one-off, and that's not to suggest Farker isn't, but we don't really know him yet. We only know him through Michael doing a, a daft impression of him, really, and then what we saw at a distance of, of him at Norwich. No, but there's no denying that what he did that season was incredibly good. Now, I mean, not discounting the second title that they won under him um, completely, but the first time around, we were there. We were in the thick of it, and they were the you know, the best team in the division, weren't they? I'm not saying they necessarily played the best football, um, and we're probably biased on that front, but I do think some of Leeds football eclipsed anything else that was played in the league that season. Um, and you get some disagreement on that from Norwich and Sheffield United, and that's totally fair enough. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. But Norwich were the best team because the table said so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his system relies quite heavily on number 10. It was Wendia, wasn't it, when they yes. were in the championship? Yeah. What do Leeds need to do apart from get a really good number 10? And how do you find one for this division that's not already playing their trade in the Premier League? I, I think they're going to have to spend some money, aren't they? They're going to have to... They, 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 the message we keep getting is that they want to be aggressive with the wage bill, particularly, um, and I would think as aggressive as they can be with transfer fees. They're going to have to, they're going to have to land some really good players. They are, and that will involve pushing the boat out. We, um, we were circulating that bit of research, weren't we? That um, came from an American source, and that it was analysis of uh, how you get promoted. And basically, the long and short of it is, it doesn't really matter if you churn your squad quite a lot, which is what we're going to have to do have the highest wage bill and, yeah. be, and be aggressive. So you wonder if that sort of thinking is informing what they're doing or, or what they plan to do for this coming season. Again, not an exact science, but I always remember, um, and I think I'm repeating myself here, but I remember Chilino cutting the wage bill down to £13 million pounds, um, deliberately after he bought the club. And Adam Pearson, who for a while was his sort of de facto chief exec, used to say quite openly, a £13 million pound wage bill. And things have changed now, you know, so obviously wages have gone up and, and are more expensive again so it's it sounds even smaller than it would be um, today but he said that the £30 million pound wage bill will simply not get you promoted that doesn't give you enough in your squad um, to, to get out of the division and while you need to spend money on transfer fees wages tend to be the critical thing wages are what get you a higher calibre of player um, you know, better quality of player in the same way as when it comes to what kills you as a football club and what does you in financially it tends to be the wage bill rather than what you spent on transfer fees alone which is why that research reinforces the idea of quick and dirty doesn't it it's spend the money hope it works it's kind of high risk high reward really yeah yeah um i mean even under bielsa it's funny because when you pick through the the, the squad itself it's not really the, the side that got promoted it wasn't really full of hideously expensive players um, I mean I know they devoted a lot of money to Helder Costa um, comparatively speaking Bamford came in at, at £7 million but you did have a lot of players there who had been inexpensive you know so Cooper and um, Clake and Hernandez you know players like that who had not cost a huge amount of cash but they did have a big wage bill in the championship it was sizeable um, so it would be wrong to say that that was not done using money it, it absolutely was but it was also done using exceptional coaching talent and some quality football. And to go back to the, the Chilino figure, that would have been about 50% of turnover probably at the time, whereas you look at teams that go up, it, well, it quite often exceeds 100%, doesn't it, particularly once you factor in bonuses? Yeah, I'm I'm totally, totally guessing here, although I have got this stuck in my head. I think the turnover under Chilino in that particular season was around about 27 million, so it would have been about half the wage bill. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. So when, when Radrazani came in, one of the first things that the club, looked at and wanted to do was to massively enhance their revenue because they didn't feel that in any way um, it was properly reflecting what they should be earning. You know, they, they felt like there was a, a lot of growth to be made on that. So they specifically targeted 50 million as the figure they wanted to get to, which they pretty much did if, if they didn't actually clear it again. It's a while since I've been through the accounts. But they, they 
I think they did go beyond 50 million, but they certainly got to that ballpark because th- they looked at the club and said, we are not maximising any of this. You know, we, we should be earning a lot more. And yeah, £27 million income for Leeds is, is a small figure when you're talking football terms. That research that I'm just referring to, and I think again, I've touched on this before on our show, so apologies if you have heard it or I'm repeating myself, but um, one of the other strands to what was in it was um, turnover really helps and Leeds United will have the biggest turnover in that division yes. next season. It should be, what, 100 million, something like that, include, if you include the parachute payments, which I was the other big thing so. is. Yes. So, so they're the two huge advantages you can give yourself in that division. High turnover, parachute payments, use them wisely is about the the size of it. But you, when you're saying... Um, I say quick, wisely, wages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you were saying quick and dirty. Um, that is because, precisely because parachute payments aren't indefinite, you know, don't last forever. And precisely because the longer that you're in the championship the less clout you have when it comes to negotiating sponsorship deals and so on, which for Leeds are, are pretty lucrative in comparison to a lot of other clubs, but are still, you know, well, well below what you earn in the Premier League. Yeah, and quite simply, you can't sustain the wage bill necessary to go up once you get to about year three, year four in Not the championship. Easily. It's, what, it's no. what's happening to like West Brom, for example, isn't yeah. it? Who are really struggling now financially because their parachute payments have... Of um have dried up, so you've then got to readjust. So if you don't do it when you've got the advantage over the rest of the division, then you kind of snook it, and you're going to become one of the other clubs in the division. It's like the pincer movement. On one side, your parachute payments fade away and disappear completely, and you're then reliant on shareholder investment. But on the other hand, as well, you have FFP um or profit and sustainability um, restrictions, which mean that at some point you have to start making cuts and you have to start um yes tightening the belt. All the rumours so far then, Phil, of, of players that we might be looking at, there seems to be a common thread, and I've just jotted down a few then as you were speaking. We're talking like Max Ahrens has been linked, Sam Field at QPR, Ilias Chair, uh, there's a guy at Coventry Hamer. Is it Hammer or Hamer? A uh, Hamer, I think. Yeah, and uh, Manning at Swansea was the guy who's the left-back who's, who's out of contract. It all, they're all of a similar stripe, kind of the, the cream of the championship, which is one of those phrases that's been sort of bobbling around in Leeds, uh, yeah, in Leeds orbit, hasn't it? We, um, we ran a piece this week saying that they like Nat Phillips over at Liverpool. Um, centre back there who's been out on loan a few times and has played for Liverpool um, a handful of times as well but he was at Bournemouth the second half of their promotion season in 2022 and again even though he's at a Premier League club I think fits the bill of somebody who probably falls into that category of are they a Premier League player are they a Championship player but would be would be a good investment I don't think he'd be wildly cheap seem to be talking about £10 million over at Liverpool but again a little bit like Farker or the some of the other candidates that they've been looking at um, as head coach, it, it just seems kind of like common sense, doesn't it? Do the obvious thing, which is the, what we've been asking of do, them for a while, I guess. Do the obvious thing without making it so obvious that you don't actually give any thought to it. You know, the, you can still be a little bit creative with this, with recruitment, but don't turn your nose up at things just because it's what everybody else would do. Yeah, and, and if you build, I mean, it's just my my thought on it. I don't know if you agree. If you build a squad of really good championship players, do that first. It's the, it's the walk before you can run mentality, isn't it? But if you can then take them up with you, if you do get up, and we need to be careful not to be thinking too far ahead, but while still planning for what's next, I guess, isn't it? It's, it's that delicate balancing act. You give yourself a good foundation of, of like-minded players, and, then, and it's then what you put on top of it. Because my feeling is that when leads have gone up and we've tried to build on and accentuate the players that took us up, it's, that's where the failure has been, really. For Leeds. Yeah. And we've, we've found ourselves still, even at this point now, having been relegated, we're still looking at those same players, that same band of players, Dallas, Cooper, you know, um, Bamford's still in there, Forshaw even to an extent. They're the ones we're still looking at now to sort of dig us out of it, even all this time on. And, you know, it's, it's three years since we went up. I think one of the things that the 49ers will want to do differently is to have more of a fixed strategy for, for transfer windows. And it wasn't that Leeds never had a plan when Otto was here, it wasn't like they never had a, a strategy for what they were going to do when the window opened. But you did quite often see it change and you did quite often see it move. Um, so you would go from a scenario where for weeks and weeks it had been De Ketla, and then suddenly at the last minute it was Gakpo and then it wasn't Gakpo, it was Bamba Dieng and then in the end it's not Dieng and it's Willie Nonto who comes in and, and not knocking that transfer because Nonto is clearly a really talented player and actually looks like a, a real snip at, at £5 million. Pounds. But... There doesn't, there isn't necessarily an awful lot of coherence there. Um, you don't seem to be dead set on what it is you're doing, how much it is that you're going to pay, or what you're going to commit, what sort of level it is that you want the player to be from. You bear in mind as well that that last week of the window, we had the program notes from Angus Kinnear saying 
pretty much. We don't need another centre forward. And then obviously there were injuries in that week, so you know, not being clever about that. But we don't really need another centre forward. Then actually at the last minute you're totally scrambling and you're having to do non to late on. I think they would like it to be more structured and more orderly than that. And and to be to be fairly clear, what you said there about getting promoted and then going from there, I almost feel like that applies to the head coaches that they're looking at as well. So somebody like Farker, it without being unfair to him. You have to say that previously it hasn't worked for him in the Premier League. And you can make a completely different environment for him than you had at Norwich. You can give him more money um, than he had at Norwich. You can give him a, a much better chance. But I suspect that there will be an element of, of the train of thought with this of being, can't be sure that this would work in the Premier League, but at the moment we're not in the Premier League and we need to get out of the Championship. And therefore, if he fits and he works, then in this window, perfect. And then we see where it goes from there. It says a lot about trying to bridge that gap, doesn't it? That there have been rumours that they'd give him a one-year contract with a view to extending it at the end. I mean, I know it's just an internet rumour at the minute, but I saw that and I thought, wouldn't surprise me. The way, the way that things it, are going, if, if if they went up and then put somebody else in, you just it, would not be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me if, in ideal circumstances, they would like to do that. It would surprise me somewhat if Farker wanted to say yes to that. Um, it doesn't seem like a particularly great contract to get yourself onto, and you're almost setting yourself up for exactly that discussion yeah. next summer where somebody says, thanks very much, but, you know, here's, um, well, whoever it is. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, when it gets round to whoever they appoint, we'll we'll see. But I think I think there th- just seems to be a, a bit of pragmatism, actually, about where they're at and, and what they need to do. But evidently, they, have, they still have a hell of a lot to do, and mm. time is ticking. You know, pre-season starts next week, and they're not in any way, you know, not in any way ready for the start of the season. That transfer window, the one we were just describing then, do you think maybe that was one of the most damaging periods for um, for Victor Orta and the club as a whole in terms of projecting the sense that everything was under control? I think that window in particular eroded it. We'd had little senses of it before with transfers that had not quite happened. You know, when they were they were sniffing around Guardiol, for example, and that became public knowledge, didn't it? And then he, he opted to stay and then go to to Red Bull and to Leipzig and they go for these players doesn't quite work out we move on to another one but it feels to me like that window in particular just really exposed that that methodology and I, f- I find it interesting what you're saying there about maybe a lack of coherence that, that like you don't look at Willy Nonto and the price that they paid and the, the place that they got him from as being in any way similar to, to Gakpo or De Ketela. No, no definitely not um, and all this time and attention spent on De Ketela, and you do think that at some point in that, you could have just said quite simply, "You know, are you coming? Are you are you going to are you going to join us?" I mean, I, just to, to kind of divert for a second, I very much got the impression that Manchester City with Declan Rice only wanted to go to a certain amount of money, but also it seemed as if Rice was kind of set on Arsenal, and you know that when it became clear that it probably was going to be Arsenal for him, City just seemed to say, "Okay, well, you know, in that case, we're out." And and you get on with it. The Ketlar did seem to drag and drag and drag, and you know, almost to the point where you were thinking yourself, "Is that this doesn't seem to have legs in it?" You know, this doesn't feel like it's it's going to happen. I think the the build up was incremental. I would say with transfer windows, going back to the summer where Leeds signed Furpo and Dan James, neither of those two particularly worked. Um, I, I still not convinced that James was a player they particularly needed in that position but neither worked and then the following January in which there was the narrative from the club that they couldn't find players that Bielsa wanted Bielsa saying no to quite a few who were put on the table um, the comings and goings with Drami kind of forcing his way out to Cardiff um, Somerville hinting at the very end of the window that he wanted to go and Bielsa saying if you want to go then you can but the club not letting him leave and then as you say bounce on to the, the following summer a lot of that summer was actually quite orderly in that they got Tyler Adams and they got Rocker and they got Christensen and without going into whether those were good signings, the players that they went after, mostly, they, they were able to, to get. But there was the scramble at the end of it and there was, again, just that feeling of us on the outside looking at the squad saying, you don't seem to have enough up front. Uh, the club saying, yes, we do. And then suddenly at the end of the window, you know, that late dip for Gakpo that didn't pay off. Bamba Dieng not getting on the plane from France and then filling a medical anyway, and then Nonto coming in. And I don't think you could say that subsequent to that, the January window just gone, um, did anybody any good either. 
you know. Yeah, and stuff like Dieng as well. I've forgotten about him completely in, yeah. in the mix up there because we ended up with Nonso, who ended up being the gem. Dieng, Dieng came out of nowhere. I mean, Dieng was, which isn't to say that Leeds hadn't, because, you know, Alta did do a lot of background into these guys and he did ha genuinely have lists of people that he liked. You know, that's how it works. But Gakpo, the, he flew to Holland, tried to get Gakpo, had, you know, a, a jet booked that would have taken everybody back had Gakpo said yes and had um, a deal been done with PSV, but it didn't happen. So Gakpo stayed where he was. And then suddenly at around about lunchtime on deadline day, it was Bamba Dieng. You know, and you know, that you know that was just kind of out out the blue, and I suppose that ties into what I was saying about you know having a coherent strategy. It's some the, the the other aspect of this is that the football isn't you know football's pretty volatile. And football can be pretty unpredictable, and you have to accept that actually in some transfer windows you do have to move on your feet and you do have to react at late notice. And not everybody that you go for you will get, and you can't in all circumstances just say if we don't get who we're after, we're not going to sign anybody because sometimes you do just need a centre forward or you need a, a centre back. But it did start to feel very random and it didn't start to feel like it was in order. But I still don't think that... I think that the summer window of 2021 was really damaging for the consequences for the Bielsa era um, and the consequences for the, the deterioration of the squad. But I think the one that probably did for all to most was the January just gone, in which they devoted so much money to Ruta. Um, they brought in McKinney, who did not really play well or, or fit particularly. And yes, they signed Verba, who looked like a solid signing, but was injured quite a lot. Was you know, left back, left centre back, whatever it was. Um, it just felt as if everything had run out of road. But you're saying the approach now seems to be a little bit more methodical, or that's certainly what well, the 49ers uh, would like to it, pursue it, when they are have the keys to the castle i can't say it is more methodical because i haven't actually done anything yeah, yeah. yet but uh, uh you would like to think that it will be yeah and is that down to having hammond in place um just a general a corporate strategy of things being more orderly and, and controlled where, where do you think that's coming from well i think marathi himself he obviously he's never worked in football before or at least he's been vice chairman at leeds but this is the first time that he'll actually be leading the, the running of a, a football club soccer club um and and one in Europe, one in England, you know, like the, the real sort of coal face of, of of global football, um, albeit in the championship rather than the Premier League. But he does have twenty years of experience of working in NFL and as much as it doesn't all overlap or cross over perfectly, that will involve um contractual negotiations with players. He is the main um contract negotiator over there and and we're expecting him to carry on in that role. You know, I don't think he will be relinquishing 49ers um, responsibilities completely to, to devote everything to Leeds. He's also been involved in the draft. I mean, that was what got him into the 49ers in the first place was bringing in a kind of data mind, mind to look at um, potential signings in a different way to the sort of naked eye scouting that had been, that had been going on before. And we, we published a profile of Marathi this week. And it's quite interesting because you, you see there the culture war that went on in NFL about your traditional people who found players by scouting and looking at them, you know, what does the naked eye say? It says this, okay, let's sign this player versus the new breed who were starting to use analytics and statistics and everything to try and find... The money ball approach. Yeah, yeah. Very, very much so. And there was resistance to that as there has been in English football, less so now, you know, and, and the same in NFL where people kind of embrace all this stuff and clubs actively recruit on that front. But for a long time um, in NFL and 49 circles, the supporters in particular looked at Marathi and said, I don't know what this guy does. You know, he got blamed for a lot of what was going wrong there because they couldn't really work out what his his involvement was. But I think the way in which they would recruit in NFL, the way in which they would analyse players and, and stick to what it was that they thought they wanted, I think that will be driving quite a lot of this. And in, in him, him and others around him saying, you should always have a strategy and you should always be clear on what you're doing and you shouldn't just flip-flop at the last minute. I think what they will find out over time is that sometimes you don't have a lot of choice but to flip-flop. Do you think that we were perhaps missold that as being the approach that was in place at Leeds? And actually, was it maybe a little bit more on Victor Orta's whims at times? I'm thinking particularly back to the January transfer window when we've thrown a hell of a lot of money at Jorginho Ruta, and you could argue that wasn't the thing that we needed. Even though you could argue we needed a forward, was it that forward at that particular moment at that particular price, or could that money have been better spent elsewhere? I still think he's a good player, Ruta, but perhaps eighteen months into a really difficult period with one season where you've just avoided relegation, and then another season where it's hovering over you again and, and might well be coming. 
perhaps you have to be honest enough to say we we don't have the luxury of experimenting or we don't have the luxury of saying this is going to come good in five years time you know that with hindsight it really does and it wasn't even with hindsight i think people felt at the time it was a window where it had to be signings that were going to pay off there and then i think with Ruter, he was doing well at hoffenheim and, and he was well thought of in the bundesliga and you did kind of feel like it, it you know it it wasn't a wasn't a bad investment as such but you know there's a lot of talk about gukuresh at coventry and it's easy now to say well that would have made more sense but but he couldn't have failed to make less uh, to make um more impact than than Ruta, because Ruta hardly played and and hardly hardly featured. Um, I still think that one of the one of the biggest problems was the attempts to shoot for the stars when realistically you were unlikely to ever get there. The Kettle being one, Gakpo being another. You know, it's it's fine to go after these players, but if if it's not going to materialise, and if it was never going to materialise, I mean, the Kettle seemed pretty set on AC Milan, even though. Leeds could pay more money or have more money to play with. And this is something that Serie A clubs complain about quite a lot, that you know, even a lower-level Premier League club seems to be able to bid aside who are getting to the, the semi-finals of the Champions League. But Tiketla seemed set on that move. So if you spend weeks and weeks on that, um, in the end, what's it going to deliver for you? Do we think he's going to stay? Ruta? The, oh, I thought you meant Tiketla. No. Right, say, um, I, mean, it hasn't I, don't well. be, I don't think he'll be coming to the Championship. Uh, no, I wouldn't have thought so. It hasn't gone well for him at AC Milan. It hasn't really... Um, really done much there at all the indication I was getting at the start of the summer was that Ruta most likely would stay yeah that that he was one that they really wanted to keep and I haven't, I know there was a bit a bit of talk about him uh, about Hoffenheim being interested in signing him on loan again and um, the message still seems to be that Ruta might well stick around and I do think season in the championship could be really good for him mm. Yeah. Credit, credit to Tommy underscore LUFC who when when he saw that link of him going back on loan he said this deal continues to blow my mind in order to get Jorginho Ruta we had to give them 25 million up to 10 million add-ons and Jorginho Ruta <laughs> <laughs> bargain you mentioned before Phil pre-season is bearing down on us now we still yes. don't know anything of pre-season plans do we and again I guess this is all it's all related to takeover ratification nobody wants to definitely put plans in place because you're not quite sure who's making those plans at the moment so uh, do we have any word on on pre-season will anything happen will we have any matches or will it all just well the, we'll just start the season and see what happens yeah just, just go for, again like fifa when you just skip through the um <laughs> the pre-season games on on sim mode yeah um the my unless i've missed something this week and i have been often about um man united in oslo is still the only one that is um formally announced there will clearly be others um, but yeah, we're we're still waiting on a, f- a full and, and fixed program. Um, next week they they they're obviously about to come back. Um, they in previous summers they've gone to Leeds Beckett University uh, for initial testing. So you know they get blood tests and heart tests and I think brain tests as well. You know, it's quite a strong focus these days on concussion and and the health of of your brain. And then after that, it will spill into actual training um, as you have to do, which is why they wanted a head coach in place and you would just feel that that has got to give very very soon soon like soon. now <laughs> soon. i think i said soon last week and the week before yeah yeah it does feel like it's dragged on beyond all uh on all reason is do, do, do we reach a point phil do we reach a point where they say right okay, where we've all had enough we've, we've, I think we've, <laughs> we're already well past that do we do we reach a point where they go right yeah this is the, the manager's farker we'll sort out the rest of it in a bit because i say it's now friday as we as we record the new season in the financial sense starts on Sunday. The first of July is the very first day of the uh, of the twenty three twenty four season. So, and that's the that's the reason why contracts start on that day. They generally get them back in for preseason training around that day, or as near as damn it. Um, and, and yet nothing's given. Is there a point at which they they bite the bullet and say, right, okay, this is happening? It, it's very much been on my mind this week that about the the coming a point where you feel like you can't actually function as a club because you don't have what what you need. Um, and you get another week into the, into this summer, you're less than a month away from the start of the season with all your transfer business to do and um, all your outgoing business to do as well. Um, it, clearly, they've been waiting for the takeover in order to do the head coach, but there has to come a cutoff point, doesn't it? I was, was going to say at this rate, because you know they start to do like photographs of pre-season training starting. It's going to be... They'll be taking pictures of the walls at, at Leeds Beckett and the trees at Thorpe Arch at this well, rate. There's still plenty of players there, you know. They can they can do pics of the players, but yeah, no, you're, yeah, which, you're right. Which three should we photograph um, but, on rotation? But that but that's it. You see, in order to paint it as 
here we go for next season. Um, there'll be players there who are going to be gone um, before the season starts or before the end of the transfer window. Um, there are going to be a lot of faces who aren't there who will arrive subsequently um, as, as the transfers start to pick up. I think what the club will be hoping for is just, you know, the, the starting gun of EFL approval, which means that they can get on with 101 jobs that need to be sorted. Where do you want to go for pre-season, Phil? Um, I'm off to Malaga on holiday. In, Another uh, one? Uh, yeah. Um, what is the summer? You know, I know, I know people. <laughs> what do you think this is, Phil? I know. I, know um, I was somebody was more about my holidays on Twitter the other week, and I was going to say to him, "I tell you what, you send me your holidays for approval, and I'll send you mine." And both of them will agree on that. You've already got um, Cardiff, Plymouth, all these places coming up. This I know. Year. What do you need? What do you need other holidays I know, for? It's like um, Phil Rostron, um, the late Phil Rostron, who's my first sports editor at the Evening Post, used to say to me, "You must think Europe's somewhere just outside Gillingham." <laughs> 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 it's it, it, yeah, it's going to be yeah. Um, all the all the bright spots of the UK, uh, so I might well miss uh, a lot. Well, might well miss a lot of preseason. Will miss a lot of preseason. Um, so it doesn't really. Yeah. I I really really hope that we do a preseason training camp in Malaga. How good would <laughs> when, that be when you're yeah. there and your poor wife and children have just just been abandoned? Yeah, we're not miles from. Um, we're actually we're, we're flying to Malaga, but we're. Uh, we're quite a way away from there, but we're not fast from Lamanga. Seville, so oh. I can I can drop into Malaga for the training camps, and then I'll go to Seville um, to interview Otto and yeah, <laughs> Bosman's holiday. Do we have anything else to add then um, on this? Well, we've we managed to fill quite a bit of time there. I know, despite there being no news. I know. Um, I, don't, I don't think people are going to feel greatly enlightened at the end we, of this. But... Should we just reminisce about Bielsa a bit more? Oh, it was good, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's talk about our Stoke game again. <laughs> I mean, actually, look, I am genuinely sort of quietly optimistic about this new season in the sense that we're about to start something new we're about to see some new faces and I think maybe we just kind of got we got mired in this this cycle that just it all went off the rails it all went a bit woolly and it was a bit shit wasn't it really yeah it's this summer to to give the club a little bit of leeway with this this summer has not been helped by the kind of ludicrous schedule of World Cup in the middle of it and all of us still cracking on on the last weekend of May so you know it, it's it's cut down the available time, um, but it the time is really really ticking now. It is. Well, is it a fair criticism to say that? Because I've seen a lot of fans saying this. Forty Nine ers should have moved sooner on this one. They should have known. They should have done something sooner. And, and I say that just I am just being devils out. Playing devil's yeah, advocate they, here. they obviously could not have done the Premier League takeover for obvious reasons. Yeah, um, because in the end they haven't been buying a Premier League club, so they could not have done the deal on the terms that were in place and agreed. That was that. That specific takeover on those terms is always going to die a death if Leeds went down, and it's just you know that that's just rational, rational way of looking at it. So, sorry, um, Phil. Just a they, second on that. I was just going to say, is it worth perhaps just expanding on that because there's been a little bit of muddying of the waters in the sense that there was a deal in place for January 2024, which was the higher price, and then they, they negotiated a separate deal yes. around January January February this year for a lower price. Yes, and that's the Premier League deal you're talking about. So the second yes. the second one. Yeah, the the option for 2024 January was at a higher level higher level of cost than but still very much the, the deal that was done for this summer um would still have been at premier league valuation you know um it would not be it would have been somewhere close to 400 million pounds as far as i can tell or somewhere between three and four hundred million so double if not more than the 170 that, that it's been valued at now um so yeah that that was there what they didn't do and what they chose not to do was to engage actively in talks about a relegation deal until the club were actually relegated, that was their decision, um, and that is. Well, well, when you say they, is that the Forty Nine ers Enterprises or is that well, Rodrizani or both of them or what? The Forty Nine ers Enterprises certainly didn't get into that discussion. Um, it wasn't as if from March onwards or beginning of April or that, say post the Palace game where it started to look incredibly dicey. Like everybody sat down and said, "Right, okay, let's sort out a contingency here so that on the day the season ends, we know exactly what's going to happen and what we're going to do." You know, it it took relegation and it took the end of the season for that all to start moving which is why it needed another two weeks in order for them to come to the agreement about what the club was going to be sold for in the championship um i think there probably was a risk towards the end of the season that you were complicating things in radrazani's mind by trying to get him to the table to discuss what how a deal was going to look if leeds were back in the championship but those circumstances are the reason why everything is up against it now as i say you know you, you you look for the EFL to approve 
at the first opportunity. But I think the EFL would say, and fairly, that they're going as quickly as they can. Um, they just haven't been given a huge amount of time with this. Because the criticism of 49ers Enterprises based on that then is going to be, well, we knew this was coming. You mm. knew this was coming. Why didn't you get this sorted sooner? You've been around for, for several years. Yeah, I mean, the, a little bit like the timing of appointing a head coach, it's only going to get criticised if next season doesn't go well. You know, if next season falls into place and um, and it all ticks along nicely and leads get promoted, then nobody's going to look back to this summer and say it shouldn't have been done differently. But I think if it doesn't go well this season or if it doesn't quite happen in the way that it's supposed to, it'd be very difficult not to say that it was far from the ideal starting point, um, being in a, a close season where you were having to kind of urgently... Um, negotiate a, um, a takeover and then wait for the EFL approval, approval in order to make other other big decisions. Um, so we'll we'll see on that front. We shall see. Um, back on Monday then to talk about nothing again. <laughs> oh, excellent! Yeah, let's let's see. You never know. Should Long get, weekend. Let's get the let's get the emergency BL to show ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us on this one. Um, if you've stayed with us. Uh, in the absence of anything, it's not we've got nothing to talk about because we are seeing names linked, but it all feels like everything is predicated on getting this takeover done, yes. doesn't it? Just yeah. get that get that done, get it signed off, and then this project, this new start, starts properly. Yeah, they must they they must have itchy feet inside Ellen Road. Everybody must be sitting there thinking to themselves, "Got to get on with this. Got to get on with this." Um, and and as you say, I think the point you made about do they come to the stage where as far as a head coach goes, they, they all say to themselves, we're just going to have to do something, is is a really fair question. Um, I think it'll probably be very much on their minds too. Fingers crossed it gets sorted. Will's probate conveyancing, should we talk about that a bit more on Monday? We'll probably come out of this and find that the takeover gets announced in half an hour. Yeah, absolutely. Then... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in which case, everything we just said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, should, we should say, Phil, because people think you always know everything. And, no. And you, I mean, you're not, you're not expecting to go to a press conference at Ellen Road later today, are you? Well, I'm off this week anyway. Um, you're not so your I'm, film. I'm, um, I'm heading <laughs> off to watch the Ashes shortly. Uh, but no, we certainly. Um, so I quit checking my mobile just in case. <laughs> in case uh, message that? on it. Oh, I can see from here you've got a notification, Phil. It's saying press conference at what time? What does that say? Oh no, the only message is my wife telling me that I forgot my nephew's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> go away and sort that out urgently. Items to buy at a supermarket, that's all I ever received. He lives in Australia, so it's going to have to be a bit more creative. It's, um, than that. it's like a plot line from The Fresh Prince, isn't it, Uncle Phil? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There we go. On which note, we will uh, be back on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you in a bit. The Square Ball Podcast.